I got scares. Oh, do you ever. Charming. This'll keep us flying for a while. Uh, I done good then? Yeah. Look, I've got a proposition for you. But jeez, I'm flattered, Mr. Chance, but uh, I don't, uh, I mean, I ain't into, you know. I'm mildly ashamed to admit that Impossible Creatures somehow managed to completely skirt my perception for far too long. It only came to my attention in college thanks to a good friend of the show, Noah, who drew the channel art. The Isle of Dr. Moreau for Children is a game in which you combine animals and send the resulting creatures into battle. Something that would have blown me away as a kid. It kind of does as an adult. But does that intriguing concept hold up when the game starts? Well, I should talk about the game's history a bit first. Try to ignore Big the Cat in the corner. He's there to disguise the FPS counter I accidentally left in all my footage. Released January 7th, 2003, Impossible Creatures is the product of Relic Entertainment. Yeah, that's right. The legendary creators of Dawn of War and Company of Heroes created this thing as their second project, eight months before Homeworld 2. As a personal anecdote, I am baffled that I somehow managed to play every 2000s Relic game except for this one. And yes, that includes the outfit. Anyway, the story of Impossible Creatures begins in the year 2000 with a game of a different name. Originally dubbed Sigma The Adventures of Rex Chance, it was the result of Relic signing a deal with Microsoft Game Studios. This was when Microsoft was beginning to make itself a player in the video game market. I'm putting on my tinfoil hat here, but the success of the RTS genre in the 90s likely made Microsoft see dollars on the table. I'd like to think that in between lines of nondescript white powder, some exec gave Relic a bag of cash and said, make a new thing that's just like the other thing you made, before diving nose first back into another line. Much of what constituted this game changed with each successive preview. Originally, creatures had to be captured from the environment for experimentation. There was an entire mechanic about depopulating sections of the map from overharvesting. A rather poignant environmentalist message. Eventually, this was changed to yoinking the DNA from creatures to Jurassic World new ones. The name changed to Impossible Creatures, a much better title, in November 2001. Notably to me is that Impossible Creatures resource currency is changed from preview to preview. Originally, the gatherable resource was food, then it became scrap, before eventually settling on coal and electricity. Practically, the only thing that stayed the same through each iteration was combining the animals and battling the results. By early 2002, it seems that Impossible Creatures was in a near-feature-complete state according to previews I've read. However, the game was delayed from late 2002 to January 2003, likely due to the fact that there are over 41,000 different combinations of 51 animals in the base game. A metric ton of testing and polish would be needed to make sure everything runs smoothly. And even then, there are some hiccups with the creature creator. Basically, the fact that this works as smoothly as it does is both a miracle and a testament to the team at Relic who made this game. Impossible Creatures would release to generally positive reviews. I read a couple of them, and most seem to recommend the game on premise alone while having some criticisms of the gameplay. Impossible Creatures holds a weird distinction for being used in an early Steam showcase by Valve. I say it's weird because the game would not join the platform until 2015, but that's a spoiler. While I can't find any sales numbers, Impossible Creatures seems to have done poorly enough to have warranted a free expansion pack. Dubbed Insect Invasion, it was released in 2004 alongside the game's SDK for mod makers. Usually, this would be the end of the story. I would now go on about how this game was abandoned and forgotten except for by those who love it dearly. But this is not a usual circumstance. According to this VG247 article by Brenna Hillier, someone at THQ Nordic wanted Impossible Creatures to see the light of day. You should seriously read this article because the length of what THQ Nordic did to bring this game back to life is insane. First off, the IP rights ended up belonging to Relic despite Impossible Creatures being published by Microsoft. That's some business no jutsu if I've ever seen it. But it also meant that Relic's then current parent company Sega owned the rights. More business no jutsu was had, and Sega relinquished control of the game to Nordic. Unfortunately, they only had a 1.0 version of the game. <sighs> the long tradition of terrible data preservation continues to haunt the industry. Thankfully, there was one Polish hero by the name of Wojciech Knopf who seems to have done the bulk of recreating the lost post-launch work. THQ Nordic would release Impossible Creatures onto Steam in 2015 to pretty much everyone's surprise. 
it also seems to have continued the trend of not selling all too well. But hey, it exists and it's easily available to play. That's more than can be said for an unfortunate amount of games. Now, visually, it looks like an early 2000s 3D game. The lighting is static, models are low poly, and the textures are a bit muddled. But I'd argue they hold up to a degree, mostly because the world in general has a Saturday morning cartoon aesthetic. Human characters especially. Their wacky proportions somehow cement the absurdity of it all for me. Look at that big man run. A lot of the animal modeling is still impressive to this day given the limitations of the time. Not to mention the wacky combinations between animals. There were plenty of times where I started uncontrollably giggling over the monstrosities I had made. The UI's visual style really stands out to me as well. It has an old-timey look and I really like the placement of the minimap in the bottom center of the screen. I noticed that I had an easier time keeping track of things because of it, even though the very bottom of the map seems to be cut off due to the rounded visual aesthetic. Eh, I think it's worth it. The environments are really the weakest part of the visuals for me. Every map is an island with the only real difference being the climate. Most maps are a forgettable sludge of yellowish greens and browns. The Arctic maps stand out the most in my mind, but that's because they were stark white and building shadows seem to have worked properly. Impossible Creatures soundscape is far more memorable to me than its visual design. The game's main menu theme gives me a sense of hijinks from sound alone. It is considerably more memorable than the rest of the score. No offense to Crispin Hands, but Jeremy Soule is in fact a legend for a reason. Many of the sound effects are appropriately cartoony for the visual aesthetic, building destruction noises especially. The animals mostly make appropriate noises, but some of them are a bit iffy to me. Like, is that really what a chameleon sounds like? What does a chameleon sound like? Truthfully, I don't have much to say about the sound effects. I think they're generally well done without anything really standing out, for better or worse. That being said, the voice acting outclasses the rest of the sound work. Each character from the campaign is delightfully over the top with their delivery of every line. They're really big drums! Ganglion already looked like a mad scientist, but that voice seals it. What are you going to do now, Mr. Julius? Well, I need you to hold them off, Dr. Ganglion. But Mr. Julius, I'm a doctor, not a combined creature strategist. But there's one character whom you'll be hearing more than any other, and that's your average henchman. The henchman serves as the indicator for when your creatures or buildings are being attacked. They're destroying our buildings! Not to mention that he's the basic unit needed to harvest resources and construct buildings. You'll be hearing this man a lot. The terms, okay boss, and you got it boss, are causing the SCV zone of my brain to go hyperactive. One last note on the sound is that the mixing on some of the campaign cutscenes is not great, not to mention that the availability of subtitles varies as well. There was actually a point where gameplay battle music was beginning to drown out critical story. I have a request of you, but to make it, I feel that first you deserve the truth. After all these years and all you've done, I owe you that much. Not the best jank I've had, but I can feel it flooding my veins all the same. The gameplay for Impossible Creatures is the main draw for me. It's a pretty standard RTS. Coal is the limited resource needed for the production of all things. Electricity is usually required as well, which can be gathered via lightning rods or steam generators. Get enough of each resource to advance to different research levels. Each level capping out at 5 allows the player to construct new buildings and create stronger creatures. Many of the buildings are that standard RTS fare, with unit production facilities, upgrade buildings, resource gathering centers, and defensive structures. The unique building is the helipad. A henchman can become airborne and transport units, including other henchmen, to areas they otherwise couldn't reach. Which is a bit strange. In any other RTS, there would be a dedicated transport unit available in the air production building. But that can't fly since all your units besides henchmen are creatures. Thus you have to build a whole separate building, and then you must also sacrifice one of your workers to a transportation vehicle. Which really is a downside, because once airborne, they don't seem like they can land. Except unintentionally. 
and every unit counts in a game with a 50 to 75 unit limit. Though you can't build more than one, so I guess it does balance itself in a way. The creature combination is really the star of Impossible Creatures. You pick two animals from a list and then combine the features to make new creatures. Each body component comes with different attributes, increasing or decreasing the resulting creature's health, defense, speed, and line of sight. Additionally, different attacks and abilities will be available with different combinations of parts. For example, combining a chimpanzee and a chameleon results in the chimpmeleon. This creature is a ranged specialist with a long-range tongue attack from the chameleon's head and rock artillery from the chimp's arms. The chimpmeleon also has latent abilities from its progenitors. The chameleon provides the ability for this creature to regenerate its health, and its tail the ability to camouflage. This unit is invisible to the enemy until they attack or are spotted by something that can see through camouflage. Meanwhile, the chimpanzee provides the pack hunter ability, which means that when in a group of three or more creatures, this unit gets a bonus to its attack stats. The only downside is cost. The Chimpmeleon is expensive despite only being a tier 2 creature, but this is due to the rather busted ability combo. And that's just a single creature I've made. There's a wide variety of beasts to blend with aquatic and airborne creatures as well. It's all fun and games until crocodiles grow wings. Trust me, I'm from Florida. Though my personal favorite creature might be the combination of Gorilla and Sperm Whale. Look at that crime against nature, go! Building your creatures can be done on the fly in the campaign, but you'll have to either use pre-built armies for skirmish or make your own with the army builder. The army builder itself is somewhat limited with only 9 slots allowed for units across 5 tiers. I assume this was for balancing reasons. A 10th slot would go very far for my army so I can only imagine what a whole new row would allow. I should also note that the campaign limits what creatures are available to the player. To make better units, you will have to hunt them down and have Rex steal their DNA. Thankfully, if you happen to miss an animal on one island, it will likely appear on another. My complaints are as follows. Pathfinding is kinda ass. Units tend to bunch together, and there's nothing in terms of formations for you to control groups. The unit aggression ranges are absurdly high. Even when set on hold your ground, units will still chase enemies for a long distance. On aggressive, creatures will casually run into turret lines chasing after a single unit. I had to spend more time babysitting my units than I would have liked. There's also a distinct lack of variation here. By that, I mean lack of distinct factions, unique buildings, and hell, there's no hero units in Skirmish despite existing in the campaign. It seems that all the work of this RTS went toward the units, with the rest of the gameplay being an unintended afterthought. Which is a shame. Just the addition of factions would have been a huge boon for this game. As things stand, Impossible Creatures is wholly reliant upon its animal combination gimmick to both its benefit and detriment. Your enjoyment of this game is purely going to be based on how you react to its core concept. Usually, I would casually mention multiplayer in passing, but Noah wanted to play some games, so I couldn't refuse. To successfully create a game, we had to go through the game's online system because LAN battles were not working, despite being in the same room and both computers leading to the same Ethernet splitter. Whatever. Creating a THQ Nordic account was easy enough, but confirming the account led to a white page that just said, SUCCESS. All that being said, once the initial foibles were taken care of, we didn't have a problem whatsoever with the multiplayer. I can only imagine the nightmare it took to get any of this running properly. On top of the base game and expansion, there are a number of mods that exist. They run the gamut from adding more creatures, rebalancing existing animals, and more maps. At time of writing, I haven't touched any of them, however Tellurian and Dino Dawn are the mods that speak to me most. Tellurian is basically Impossible Creatures 1.5, and Dino Dawn adds Dinosaurus. I am a simple man. I see Dino, I am intrigued. The story of Impossible Creatures is as bizarre as its premise. Here's the time code for the conclusion because I can't talk around spoilers. The campaign follows the story of Rex Chance in the year 1937. He's an American journalist who has recently come back from reporting on the Spanish Civil War. After receiving a letter from his supposedly dead father, Dr. Eric Chanikov, Rex travels to the Isla Veritas island chain in the South Pacific to meet with him. Upon arriving, he finds his father's lab ransacked and full of macabre creatures, including his father's benefactor, Upton Julius. 
Julius brags about using Rex's father's tech to create the creatures before sicking them on Rex. Cue the flying steam train ex machina, complete with hot lady scientist. This is Dr. Lucy Willing, a colleague of Dr. Chenikov and the object of Rex's obvious desires. Rex Chance is a very suave individual, albeit Pepe Le Pew-esque. But as time goes on, he seems to genuinely care for Lucy, especially given what happens later in the campaign. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. The first few missions are about getting your bearings and understanding the wonders of Sigma technology. Sigma is the invention of Dr. Chenikov and Lucy, albeit Chenikov seems to have done the bulk of the work. But the resulting tech allows for the combination of animals on the genetic level. Trying to piece things together with Lucy, Rex learns everything began to go wrong once Dr. Chanikov had sent Rex the letter. For now, Rex must fight through the beasts of Whitey Hooten in order to return to his father's lab. A rather brutish man who is notorious for wailing with his bare hands. How do you even do that? In any case, upon returning to Rex's father's lab, Whitey reveals that the good doctor is nearby. Rex just needs the shovel to see him. It seems like the father and son won't be reunited after all. Rex swears revenge on Julius and to stop the abuse of Sigma. He starts by sinking Whitey. That's what happens when you build your base on ice like a fool! But in doing so, Rex draws the ire of Velika Lapet. For some reason, this disgustingly French woman had the hots for the whale puncher. Lapet flies up, talks some smack, and then lights most of the island on fire! Bitch is like a crazy Australian firehawk. Lucy and Rex decide that it's best to stop this aerial arsonist. Though Lapet manages to stay a few steps ahead over the next couple islands, the pair are doggedly on her heels. On one island, Rex and Lucy learn that the human inhabitants have been taken for use in Sigma technology experiments. Lucy is horrified at the implications. According to her, it isn't supposed to work on humans. When they finally do catch up with Lapet, she has a Wicked Witch of the West moment. Fly, my pretties. Fly! <laughs> complete with a watery demise. After these misadventures, Rusi are ambushed by Upton Julius. The lab is heavily damaged in the resulting crash, but for some reason, Rex is maintaining direct control over the Sigma creatures. Not one to look a gift horse in the mouth, Rex just rolls the punches before wiping out another altered ecosystem. Following Julius, they come to a production facility run by Dr. Ganglion. This facility is producing more Sigma mobile labs for the use in some unknown nefarious plan by Julius. Realistically, it's either world domination or making dollar dollar bills, y'all, selling the labs to nation states. I'd personally lean toward option two, but Upton Julius seems hell bent on saving America from commies and fascist outsiders. Thus, Rex and Lucy seize the means of production and wreck Julius's dreams of conquest. Lucy has a crisis of conscience on the next island after learning of Rex's intentions to destroy Sigma. Apparently, she thinks the evil tech she has sunk years of her life into can be redeemed. She sets out alone to find evidence that Sigma Tech deserves not to be obliterated. To no one's surprise, she finds a gravesite filled with the victims of Sigma's experimentation. Lucy gets her shit together and realizes her horrific tech must be stopped. Afterwards, Rex and Lucy are confronted with a new roadblock on their warpath to Julius. The decrepit Dr. Ganglion. A man so vile, he was combining creatures the old-fashioned way before Sigma. I bet that guy had another name in Ireland before this gig. His current home is a real scorcher, causing everyone but Rex to feel a real lethargic. Despite it, they manage to beat the heat and Ganglion's defenses. But upon interrogating the mad scientist, Lucy is kidnapped by one of Julius' most powerful creatures, the King. Legally distinct Kong gets away, leaving Rex with a new unsightly companion. Ganglion actually proves himself to be somewhat useful, like how the only way to defeat this door is to go around it. He even relays to Rex his true nature. See, all this time, Rex has been having strange dreams and exhibiting more animalistic characteristics. As it turns out, Dr. Chanikov had been working on Sigma for a very long time. While working under Nikola Tesla on death ray technology, an accident resulted in what is known as the Tunguska Event, a real-life occurrence in which a several megaton explosion went off in central Russia that has been fodder for this exact kind of fiction for literally a century. The death ray somehow caused the original Sigma chamber to be birthed into existence. Not even Chanikov knows what's up with this MacGuffin. At the center of this explosion was Rex and his mother. While mom passed on, Rex seemed to be completely fine despite exposure to the death ray. When evidence of strange mutations arose around the explosion site, Chanikov had Rex examined. As it turns out, Rex is technically the first successful Sigma creation. Hence why he's so in tune with Sigma creatures. 
Chanikov, however, was haunted by his actions, exiling himself to Isla Veritas to escape Tsarist Russia. Chanikov could not force his son to share this burden and instead sent him off to live in America. Chanikov wrote all this down in a letter to Upton Julius asking for Julius's help in finding his son. However, this letter was the catalyst for Chanikov's demise as Rex was what Julius was after this whole time, a Sigma-enhanced human. Oh, and this next island, which is home to Julius' failures, also has a deadly neurotoxin. Good luck curing yourself in 15 minutes! Yeah, I cheated for this one because that's a real short time limit and I failed like three times. With the toxin cured, Ganglion takes the chance to dip on Rex. Never leave your keys behind, kids. A mad scientist might nab your flying train. Rex borrows the henchman's heli to follow. At the final island, for some reason, Ganglion and Rex are having a chill walk on the beach. Methinks time and money began running out around here based on inconsistencies and cutscene quality. The pair are quickly ambushed by Meester Julius. Ganglion quickly shows his true colors, having obviously fooled Rex. The inability to control him for the last several missions definitely wasn't a giveaway. But Julius' attempt to control Rex proves futile. He breaks free and steals some creatures to boot. This last mission is pretty ridiculous as it is a war of attrition. I basically had to slow push forward and deny as much coal to Ganglion and Julius as possible. Easier said than done when assaulting this fortress. But in the end, Julius' ambitions are up in flames, much like Rex's dreams of meeting his father. Having achieved what he wanted, Rex gives Julius no further thought. Rex turns his back as Julius draws a gun. However, Snakebird Ex Machina arrives to carry Julius off into the sunset. Oh, and Ganglion had a Wily e. Coyote-esque demise about midway through the level. Lucy manages to extract herself from the wreckage of Julius' base and embraces the victorious Rex. Rex's eyes shine completely white as a stinger, showing he's in fact an impossible creature. Roll credits. Impossible Creatures is a real hidden gem of an RTS. Sure, it is both extraordinarily dated and limited in its gameplay, but its core gimmick is so strong that the rest of the game manages to be at least entertaining the entire time. It is assuredly janky, but Impossible Creatures is a strong recommendation for me if you want something wacky and inventive from an RTS. Especially for the price. Impossible Creatures is only $10 on a digital distributor near you. That's a great price for some premium jank. Now to play the zombie boat game. No, the other one. Thanks for watching. More garbage to come.